I'm going to give you um, an overview of the work that I've been doing in New Jersey, which is a state in the east where we have soils dominated by uh, altosols, alphasols, and spodosols, some of the more highly weathered soils. I got involved in this uh, in uh, 1999 after attending the uh, conference that was organized by Lawrence Datinoff. Uh, first study we did was on uh, pumpkin, and we're continuing to work in that very same field. We started out with an application of calcium magnesium silicate, which is really uh, the product that comes from Harsco. It's a steel mill slag after it's further processed, and now it's a proprietary product. I'm calling it calcium magnesium silicate. We use it as a liming material, and we're using limestone as our control. And then we had a, a fungicide treatment in there as well. And so it is a, an effective liming material. And applied at the calcium carbonate equivalent, you get the same soil pH or neutralization value out of it. One of the things that we observed very nicely was a retention of the leaf area. And this is due to uh, suppression of powder mildew disease, as many of people have already talked about. And one of the two years of the study, we saw a significant increase in pumpkin yield, but not every year. I've since followed up with this in a recent greenhouse experiment, looking at some other materials and also comparing it to dolomitic limestone, starting out with a soil that's pretty acid. And we got some very nice uh, pictures showing the effect on suppressing powdery mildew. But I think it's interesting also limestone served to suppress powdery mildew. Is it because it contains some silicon? I don't know. Or is there something else going on there? The disease progressed so that eventually we get almost complete coverage with the powdery mildew infestation, but a very good suppression of powdery mildew disease. Okay, so after we did the study with pumpkin in the field, then um, we rotated into some other crops. And in this case, I'm gonna talk about field corn. I was interested in the effect on European corn borer because in the literature you'll see about sugarcane that silicon nutrition has been shown to suppress the uh, attack by insects that bore in the stem. And so we looked at that in, in corn. And this was not with a new, fresh application, but we're still looking at the residual benefit from the uh, previously applied material to the pumpkin. So no significant increase in grain yield. This is a study that I really want to repeat with those same plots with a fresh application. And then after the corn, we rotated into wheat. We grew wheat in the uh, field for three years. And this was the work of Dr. Mary Province Boley. That was published in Soil Science. Similar type of experimental design as with the pumpkin, with an about fungicide and using the uh, calcium silicate material. But using fresh applications. And in the third year of the study, we saw a 10% increase in grain yield. Every year there was a decrease in amount of disease or lesions of some type of disease, either powder mildew or another disease. We rotated in oats, wasn't a significant increase, but just a little trend. And after that, we had the field rotated into hay crops, and we me uh, were measuring forage yields. And we also had some unlimed plots in the field, too, with a pH around five and a half. And we saw an increase in yield due to liming with red clover hay. But in terms of a difference between whether it was calcium silicate or uh, regular calcium carbonate limestone, yields were essentially the same. After that, I've rotated into some other vegetable crops, and now we're working with cabbage. There was an increase in yield with liming, and the calcium silicate plot also tended to yield better than calcium carbonate. This year, we uh, rotated into snap bean, and I don't have the data analyzed and ready to report. We're currently working on another study that we have going on. We're now looking at some woody perennials like peach. In this case, what we're interested in, I'm working with Dr. Norm Lancelet, there's a disease on peaches that it attacks the fruit, and it's called rusty spot, but he tells me it's really a powdery mildew kind of disease. And we're going to see if we can suppress or control that disease to some extent on peach. And this is just the first year of the, that study. Um, but he told me there's some, already some interesting trends going on. Um, now, we did another study looking at um, Kentucky bluegrass. In this case, 
As a soil scientist that likes to calibrate and um, soil tests so that you can make predictions, and really that's what S4 and S8 are about, the divisions that are sponsoring this symposium is like, you know, developing soil tests to make predictions. And so we collected soils from around the state of New Jersey, 18 soils, and uh, we did acetic acid extractable uh, soil tests. And this is the kind of data that we, we found, the ranges, the minimum maximums, and so on. And then we took them into the greenhouse, and we're going to look at powdery mildew infestation on the Kentucky bluegrass as an indicator of plant response and relate that to the soil test levels. And we didn't find good relationships at all with the soil test, being able to make predictions. And as a matter of fact, sometimes we actually saw more powdery mildew disease with the silicate. And I think it was because there was a stimulation in growth. Actually, growth was increased, increase in yield of Kentucky bluegrass, more density, which would be more conducive to the occurrence of the disease. So uh, there was an increase in yield and density, increase in silicon uptake in Kentucky bluegrass. And now, just to summarize some of the different crops I've, I've worked with and the kind of uh, plant tissue analysis data that we see. Now, this is where you compare the untreated control in pumpkin, corn, wheat, or Kentucky bluegrass, and then looking at the increase we saw with the addition. So you can always see silicon fertilizer. In terms of soil test, the soil test levels that we looked at with the pumpkin, it was, this is acetic acid uh, soil test extracted, 40 milligrams per kilogram for pumpkin was associated with that test, the control plots, and then in the wheat it was 33 milligrams per kilogram. And this was on a Quaker Town silt loam, which is um, an alpha sol. You know, another part of this symposium is titled nutrient management. Just think about silicon as a nutrient to be managed and where you're going to look at the recycling and so on or the removal because really a nutrient management is partly about accounting for the flow of the nutrient and so if you're harvesting wheat and you harvest the, the grain um, well that doesn't remove so much silicon but then when you take the straw and we measured the uh, amount of silicon coming off with the straw well in just our limestone plots average of three years on average per year you would be removing 24 kilograms of silicon in our amended plots we are removing about 45 pounds of silicon and so then what becomes of that silicon if you harvest or if you leave it on the on the soil I'm thinking about the principle and this is an organic farming principle because they really talk about the fifth R and that fifth R is about the responsibility to actually recycle the nutrients put the uh, crop residues or the waste materials back on the land, often in the form of compost. I think there's a lot of good questions one could ask about what becomes of plant materials after they go through a compost pile? What happens to the microbiology of it and the heating process? So can that enhance the availability of, of the silicon? Because some of the silicon can be tied up in those phytoliths and the uh, very resistant um, crystal-like structures that are in some plants. I've been out speaking about silicon to some organic groups and they get very excited when you talk to them about silicon. Tell me more about soil fertility and silicon because they don't have access to the full range of fungicides that conventional growers ask. Have whether or not they can use it, a number of questions have to be answered and it must not be on the prohibited list. Well, silicon is not on the prohibited list of the USDA National Organic Program. Generally speaking, though, the organic growers are looking for a mine product but it doesn't still necessarily preclude some of the other materials, I think, if, like, for example, if you look at micronutrient fertilizers under the organic program, micronutrient fertilizers are permitted so long as they document the need by way of soil testing or plant tissue analysis. So then it allows the use of synthetically formulated, not all of them, but some of them, of, of those micronutrient type fertilizers. And so if silicon would be in that kind of classification, I think it would be permitted. Some concluding remarks um, for my presentation. Soils in the Mid-Atlantic region may benefit from added silicon. Uh, we're not just talking about soils in the tropics. Benefits of many crops are out there, um, I've, especially cucurbits and cereal crops. I would look for benefits. Um, silicon suppresses disease 
and can reduce insect damage. It can reduce the need for fungicide. I think what we need to do is use it with an IPM program to figure out how much can we reduce it or when do we still need to use a fungicide. And the nice thing about calcium uh, magnesium silicate or the calcium silicate products is they often serve as liming materials and that is a cost to the grower anyway. It's just substituting one for the other. And at least in New Jersey, calcium silicate, the cost of it is roughly about the same cost as for limestone. So there's no additional cost to the grower, plus you get the additional benefit of the silicon. If you want to look up some of my publications, you can go to the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station website. I have a newsletter that summarizes my work. There's this article in Crops and Soils magazine as well. Anyway, thank you for coming.